When we arrived at Point Lookout, Tobar the ferryman told us that if we needed a place to rest, we should check out the nearby Homestead Motel. He said that the beds were still soft 200 years later, even if it meant they were filled with lice. But a bed is a bed in a post-apocalyptic wasteland, so off to the Homestead we go. As we approach, we see a large sign with an arrow pointing towards the entrance. Free breakfast. We find the front desk office on the southern side of the motel. Now, Tobar kind of gave us the impression that we would see somebody here, but we don't find anyone here. The place appears to be abandoned. But when was it abandoned? Was it abandoned recently, or has it been abandoned for 200 years? We don't know. But perhaps we can find something that will help us. Behind the counter, we see a key lying on a table near to a cash register. Homestead Room 1K Key. Here, we can also loot an ammunition box, a double-barrel shotgun, and some shotgun shells near to the register. There's a small little alcove directly behind the desk. This is where the motel staff entertained themselves when they weren't helping customers. And lying on a table near a television is another key, the Homestead Room 1G key. Looks like the front desk staff enjoyed their jet. We also find beer and cigarettes, all sorts of vices. There's an average locked safe beneath the television where we find a decent stash of caps. This gives us the impression that whoever runs this hotel left more recently. Well, we now have keys to two rooms. Let's go and pick the one we like best. We can start by going west, then north, around the outside of the motel. We notice, however, that most of these rooms are completely boarded up. But as we reach the back of the hotel, we find one door that we can still access. Storm door to room 1K. And inside is a horror show! I don't think I have seen more blood spatter in any one location thus far in Fallout 3. What exactly went on here? There are gore chunks piled on a nearby desk, drippings all over the floor, and spatter on the wall behind the headboard. It looks like this may be part of some sort of ritual killing. We see totems made from sticks and human bones. There's one skeleton lying in the bed, and then another leaning against a nearby wall. We see more totems leading to the bathroom, and here we find another skeleton in the tub and... Is that a pint-sized slasher mask? It is! But wait, wait, wait a minute! The pint-sized slasher was a fictional character, right? In that Tranquility Lane simulation. He was a fictional character that parents made up to make children behave. But the evidence we find in this room leads us to believe that there may be more behind the myth. Is the pint-sized slasher real? Did he make his way to Point Lookout? And did he murder these people? Poor people. Once we've had enough of this gory scene, we can head out and go east, then south around the motel. All of the other exterior doors are also boarded up. We can then go into the parking lot to see if we can find any rooms on this inner courtyard area. We find a storm door to Chamber 1G. Inside, we find another gory scene. Not quite as bloody as the last one, but still pretty awful. There's pre-war money littering the floor. And a number of skeletons, one reaching for a shotgun on a bed. He has a medical brace. And there's a bloody handprint reaching for a sensor module on a nearby cabinet. The next skeleton is in the bathroom. This one is also surrounded by pre-war money and clutches a suitcase filled with even more pre-war money. There is a sawed-off shotgun on the ground near the tub and more blood drippings around the skeleton. My guess is that this was some sort of deal gone bad. The skeleton on the bed still points his gun at the skeleton in the bathroom with the sawed-off shotgun. But we don't know what this deal was about. We don't see a big stash of chems, so it wasn't drugs. Perhaps we are witnessing the end result of a private dispute. Heading out, we can search for more rooms. We've already covered most of this building, and almost all of these doors are boarded up, but we do find one more in the northwest corner of this courtyard. Next to a traffic cone and a big glowing light, we find a door to room 1D. Inside, as is to be expected by now, we find another skeleton, but no blood, no spatter, no signs of violence. That's good, at least. On a counter to the east, we see a Chinese pistol. On the bed next to the skeleton is a suitcase and a pre-war hat. In the suitcase, we find a locker key. 
and on a nearby table, we find a stealth boy right next to a terminal called Safe House Terminal. Encrypt K, version 1910 Mark IV, clearance level gamma, secure to transmit. Since this message was saved as an audio file instead of reading it, I'll let the author read it instead. I apologize that I cannot receive you in person, Agent Zhang. Our Norfolk contact confirms your arrival. How eager the Americans are to believe that a great mind of the people would defect. Our countrymen will herald you as a hero when your work is done. To that end, let us turn to the details of your mission. This room will be your safe house in Point Lookout. Focus initially on playing the American lapdog. Do not arouse suspicion. When it is safe, use the key you were given in Norfolk to open one of the public rental lockers on the boardwalk near the motel. You will be provided with the password you'll need to access your mission debriefing. The agreed upon payment will be paid upon extraction. Hyun, Agent Zhang. With that, we begin the quest the Velvet Curtain. So Agent Chang was a Chinese spy posing as a defecting Chinese intellectual. He was really on a secret mission for the communist Chinese, but to do what? Well, the message said to look for a locker on the boardwalk, and in his suitcase we found a locker key. Heading back to Pilgrim's Landing, we find a series of lockers to the northeast, right on the boardwalk, and one is locked. We can unlock it using the key we got in the suitcase. Inside, we find Box 1207, Spy's Audio Password. Box 1207, P.O. Box? No, more like a safety deposit box. Bank. We're looking for a bank. We can listen to the audio password with our Pip-Boy. Go to the bank and use the password Xin Chan Wen. The software is configured to recognize only our voices. I am not even going to attempt to pronounce that, but if Agent Chang was sent here to collect this information from a locker here, then it's likely we'll find the bank here. And sure enough, heading north through the landing past the Ferris wheel and the bumper cars, we find the People's Bank of Point Lookout rounding the corner to the right. As soon as we enter, we see evidence of pre-war violence. There's a skeleton on the ground next to some ammunition and a police baton. There is a police hat right next to him and a whole bunch of blood beneath him. He must have been murdered right after the bombs dropped. Perhaps some of the locals decided that the first thing they wanted to do in this new wasteland was to loot a bank. After looting a bear on the ground for a little Marie, we hear the unmistakable sound of a nearby rad roach. We'll have a few more of them to get rid of. We see a loan officer's desk to the southwest, and the loan officer still sits there. Exploring the desk, we find Box 1191 Password Backup. This holotape is very similar to the one we just looted from the locker on the boardwalk. Taking a listen in our Pip-Boy. The audio password for my box is Nevermore. Okay, someone was an Edgar Allan Poe fan. Heading around to the other side, we can take care of more rad roaches. And we can open a cell to the bank vault. Inside we see one box that still has pre-war money in it, and it's here where we find all of the safety deposit boxes, most of which have been torn to pieces over the past 200 years. One box is filled with wine. Another has a garden gnome holding a plunger right next to a miniature broken toilet. It's an interesting scene. There are a few that are still closed. 1213 here, for example, 1191 at the very top. There's some buff out in one at the very bottom, and then 1201 here, also locked. We need to find a way to open these boxes. We have the audio keys, but how do we use them? Perhaps we can learn more by checking out the cashier's desk. Heading out of the vault, we can loot some lockers near the cashier's desk. We see two safes on a wall. We'll try to unlock those in a minute. There's a stash of bottle caps and pre-war money lying on the counter, and then a corpse on the ground with crutches. Perhaps this was the bank teller, a cripple or wounded man, simply working his job when he was murdered by opportunistic locals when the bomb dropped. We can read this teller's terminal, People's Bank of Point Lookout, subsidiary of Isla Negra Holdings. Another Black Isle reference. We find three entries, the first security updates. 
In compliance with our parent company, Isla Negra Holdings, we are installing a new security system for our safety deposit customers. In addition to conventional tumbler locks, the new system will offer a keyless voice recognition lock alternative. Tellers are asked to encourage both existing and new safety deposit customers to sign up for this new service. Okay, so not every box had this security feature, which may explain why we see so many of them open 200 years later. In the next one, National Security Update, all tellers are reminded to be on the lookout for any customers attempting to exchange foreign currency. Civil Defense has asked us to be especially vigilant of customers processing Chinese Yuan notes. Should you encounter such a customer, trigger the silent alarm and attempt to delay the customer without arousing their suspicion. This is interesting. Did the government know that Point Lookout was especially susceptible to Chinese infiltration? Did they know that spies were here? In the final entry, Shift Close Notes. These were the notes recorded on the night of October 18th, 2077. We got several large sum wire transfers today. We need to notify the feds in the AM. You'll need to replenish large bills. Payday is coming up. Another complaint about the voice-activated locks in the safety deposit room. Dorothy came in to fetch Burns' will, and we couldn't get his box open because his voice was the only one configured for authorization. I figure it's a long shot, but I told Dorothy to go home and see if she has any holotapes or such of Burn talking. We might get lucky and fool the lock into opening if we play it back in there. Ah... So that's how you open the boxes. We have to play back the holotape messages in the vault. This seems like an odd security feature to add to a bank. I mean, I realize this is the Fallout universe, but clearly the public realized that they had holotape recordings in this universe. By adopting this feature, you're giving a key to your security box to anyone who has a recording of your voice. On the wall are two safes. The leftmost one is locked with a hard lock, and inside we find an odd assortment of ammunition weapons and pre-war money, and the rightmost one is an average locked safe. Inside we find an also perplexing assortment of weapons and money. Perhaps it was normal for bank tellers in the Fallout universe to be so well armed, though it didn't seem to help this bank teller in crutches on the day he died. Heading back into the vault, we can use our newfound knowledge to try and open one of the two boxes that belong to the keys we found. We'll start with the one we found in the loan officer's desk. We see a speaker sitting on an island in the middle of the room. This is the voice-activated security system. When we activate it... Welcome to Bingcom. Secure teller. Vocal authorization requested. We have an option to say the password is cheese? Processing, processing, voice ID or password, not recognized, access denied, access denied. Well, of course, this makes sense. None of the holotapes we found had the password of cheese, but one of them had the password of nevermore, a la Edgar Allan Poe. The password is nevermore. Processing, processing, password verified. Voice ID, mismatch, access denied, user voice unauthorized, access denied. Of course, of course. That's right, the terminal told us we had to play back the holotapes. Opening up our Pip-Boy, we can play back the holotape for box 1191. The audio password for my box is nevermore. We see the security box door swing open, and the speaker says... Processing. Voice ID confirmed. Access granted. Inside, we find a box. And in the box, four buff out and six pre-war money. Yay! But there are still two more boxes. We'll have to find the password for the third one later, but the second one is on our Pip-Boy. We got it in the locker, and it belonged to Chinese spies. Go to the bank and use the password Xin Chan Weng. The software is configured to recognize only our voices. Processing, processing, voice ID confirmed, access granted. The door to box 1207 swings open. Inside we find another box, and in that box, a stash of pre-war money and a holotape espionage briefing. Agent Zhang. As you know, an important Chinese surveillance vessel was lost in American waters. 
Your mission is to destroy derelict submarine SSN-37-1A before the Americans can recover and analyze it. The recovery location is included in this dossier, and your cover ensures that the Americans will allow you access to their recovery operation. However, you will need an authorization code to trigger the self-destruct sequence. One of our field operatives in your area, Agent Yang, has these codes hidden in a dental capsule, but her current whereabouts are unknown. Locate and rendezvous with Agent Yang, then destroy the submarine. Report to your safe house for extraction information when the mission is complete. The will of the people protect you, Agent Yang. Agent Chang's mission is to destroy a derelict Chinese espionage submarine. The Chinese think that his cover story, being a defecting Chinese intellectual, is going to allow him close access to this sub, but before he can destroy the sub, he needs to rendezvous with another spy named Yang. Well, since we found his corpse in the hotel, along with all of the clues we have followed to get this far, we know he never rendezvoused with Agent Yang. It's been 200 years since she was last here. Is it even possible to find her trail? After looting everything in these boxes, we can head towards the door to leave, whereupon we notice a wanted poster right by the door. Bulletin. Attention citizens of Point Lookout. Wang Yang, suspected communist and Chinese sympathizer, has been reported in the vicinity of Point Lookout. Agent Yang may be operating under an alias and or using a disguise. You are required to report any suspicious persons or behavior to Lieutenant Crumfels, DIA, at the U.S. Naval Office located at 1811 St. Mary's Branch. Well, there we go. We have stumbled upon the pre-war trail of Agent Yang. And we learned that the U.S. government did know about the covert Chinese spy operations taking place here in Point Lookout. Where can we next go to track down Agent Yang? Well, our clue is in this wanted poster. Citizens were to report any tips to the U.S. Naval Office, located presumably nearby. We can now go and scour Pilgrim's Landing for this U.S. Naval Office. We find it by walking due east of this point. Inside, we find more rad roaches. Heading behind the check-in desk, we find a skeleton clutching a shotgun next to a bloody handprint. After looting the shotgun and the big stash of ammunition, we can move on into the office behind him. Here we find some filing cabinets and then a small workspace. There is a mini nuke lying on the desk in this recruiter's office. And after looting a first aid kit on the wall, we can read the DIA officer's terminal. United States Navy Field Ops, Maryland, Point Lookout, 01A. Lieutenant Crumfels, DIA Officer Liaison. We find three entries. The first, Field Report, Yang Capture Slash Transfer. Local community informants provided intelligence leading to the capture and arrest of a priority person of interest, Wang Yang, also known as Five Claw Dragon. Yang is on file with the DIA as a Chinese intelligence field agent operating within America and Canada over the past decade. Yang has been transferred to Turtle Dove Detention Camp for interrogation. Our office has so far declined comments to press and diplomats. Please have DOD relations advise regarding a public statement. So Yang was captured and transferred to a concentration camp. And the next one, public release person of interest. And we see that this entry has the same text as the wanted poster with one addition. At the very end, we see a list of her known aliases. Jamie Patrick, Maria Lopez, Stanley Derrick, and Five Claw Dragon. I wonder why they didn't include these with the wanted poster. Maybe they just didn't fit. And in the final one, we see photo file. Wang Yang. This is what she looked like. It's exactly what we saw on the Wanted poster. We can download this image to our Pip-Boy and access it at any time. Although I doubt it's going to be of much use, she probably doesn't look like this anymore. After reading the terminal, we can turn around to loot an average locked wall safe right next to a cabinet. Inside, we find some ammunition and a small store of bottle caps. We also find a jug of moonshine on the ground here, which as we learned in our last episode is the most potent alcoholic beverage in the game. Opening a door to the south. 
And with that, we finish exploring the recruitment center. Now we need to track down the trail of Agent Wang at the Turtle Dove Detention Camp. We likely first stumble upon the detention camp after exploring the Ark and Dove Cathedral. The camp is down the hill just north of the cathedral. As we approach, we see a battle going on between feral ghouls and pre-war robotic security. After waiting for the battle to die down, we can creep towards the camp to see what's left, and we are almost immediately spotted by a ceiling-mounted turret. which is quickly dealt with. We see the evidence of the fight we witnessed earlier, and just then, one of the culprits walks forward. I get the impression that there are feral ghouls all over the place, so climbing a nearby ramp, we can ascend one of the prison camp watchtowers. Here we find a tidy store of ammunition, and from here, we can snipe off any ghouls we see. That was most of them, but I saw one hiding behind this shack, pulling out our trusty dusty metal blaster. We can hop down from the watchtower and round the corner. But for now, at least, that appears to be that. The perimeter of the camp is lined with a lot of shacks. We see two outhouses to the west. And where to start? Well, let's just take them out one by one. First, exploring the shack to the southeast, we find a small room with lockers to the north and some sort of rigged up machine to the south. Here we find a skeleton sitting in a chair next to a table surrounded by a leather belt, a coffee pot, fission batteries, and some sort of huge generator erected just behind it. And suddenly we realize exactly what was going on here. We remember that the article said that Wang Yang was sent here for interrogation. This interrogation must have included torture. We find a stim pack on the table. Looks like it wasn't used in time to save this person's life. He or she was likely tortured by being hooked up to this electric generator so that the United States could get the information they wanted. I have a deep fear that we will find similar scenes in each of these shacks. Opening the door to interrogation room B. Oh god, sure enough. After looting some men tats on the ground and some moonshine on a table, we see a skeleton lying on an operating table to the northeast. There is a surgical tray nearby, spattered with blood, medics, syringes, scissors, knives, and on the operating table itself, a bone saw and more leather belts. This prisoner was tortured by being poked and prodded, who knows what they removed from this poor person before he died. Next, we head over to two shacks side by side. The first one is boarded up, but the next one leads to Dormitory A. After looting a first aid kit on the wall, we can explore this dormitory. Looks like this is where the prisoners slept. We see bunk beds lining the room. There's a skeleton at the top of this bunk bed. Heading back to the hallway, we can loot a stealth boy from a locker. Sounds like these guys were preparing to try to escape. And to the south, we see an interesting scene. These prisoners had tried to erect a barricade out of tables and chairs. It didn't seem to work for them. We find one body lying on the ground, surrounded by blood. Their only weapons were cherry bombs, which we see littering the ground near to them. But who were they fighting? Well, it must have been the prison security. Either after the bombs dropped, the guards turned on the prisoners to make sure that none of them escaped. And what we see here may have been a prisoner's last-ditch attempt to save himself. Or this could have been done accidentally by the pre-war robots. After all, we saw at least one security robot wandering around 200 years later, and the the turrets were still active. Maybe after the bombs dropped, this triggered some sort of security protocol that turned all of the pre-war guard robots hostile. At any rate, we have one more shack to explore. To the southeast, we find Dorm B. Inside, we find a similar scene, more bunk beds laid out, a few small containers, and then two more corpses to the northwest. These, like the others, are surrounded with blood. But here we find some weapons, an axe lying on the ground, next to a confederate hat? 
This paints a very different picture. Who has access to axes and the Civil War era Confederate hats buried in these mass graves? Why none other than the crazy locals? We've already found evidence of violence done by the locals even before the bombs dropped. Perhaps after the bombs dropped, the locals raided this detention center and slaughtered all of the inmates. Whatever the cause, we can head out, and to the south we see the main gate to this camp. We manage to enter through a hole in the gate. Here we find a big blasted out truck, and in the back of the truck are two human skeletons. I believe this tells us that this truck was delivering more inmates to the camp the day the bombs dropped. After all, the gate is still open when we arrive, which means anyone who had been tasked with closing it must have died. We can go through a small barbed wire maze to climb this nearby watchtower, where we find more ammunition boxes, one of which is locked with a hard lock and an assault rifle. To the southwest, there is another watchtower, but no ramp to climb it, so we can't access it. And another shack, but it's boarded up and inaccessible. To the west, we see a big gap in the fence, which leads to some sort of radio broadcast tower. And turning around to head back, we get charged by more ghouls. There is one building left to explore, and this is the big red brick administration building. The air inside is thick with dust and air particles. We see three doors. To the left, a small armory. We find frag grenades, 556 millimeter rounds, shotgun shells, pistols, mini nukes, 10 millimeter rounds, three first aid boxes, four ammunition boxes, a sniper rifle, 308 caliber rounds, and assault rifles. Quite a haul indeed. Turning around and heading into the room across the way, we find another office space, filing cabinets and desks to loot. And here we find the administrator's desk, complete with a wall safe behind a painting. We can loot a few ammunition boxes under the desk, some 44 caliber ammunition next to a 44 Magnum, and we can read the terminal. Camp Turtle Dove, clearance level alpha, commanding officers, private operations terminal. We find four entries. Alert! Suspected spy, Chinese. Federal agencies have added a new person of interest to our watch list. Dr. Zhang is a Chinese national defector. Naturalization agents in Norfolk processed his defection after jumping over from a merchant ship he was stowed away on. Zhang was apparently in communication with a U.S. naval intelligence contact for some months prior. He's reportedly brokered an immunity deal in exchange for his help recovering intelligence from the downed submarine off our coast. Chang is staying in room 1D at the Homestead Motel off the boardwalk. We are explicitly forbidden from issuing a search warrant against this location, but are authorized to monitor his activities in public. I see, so this is how he was going to gain access to the sub. He lied to these US officials saying he was going to recover intelligence from the submarine in exchange for an immunity deal, or... Or maybe this was a double cross. Maybe Dr. Zhang really was trying to defect. The Chinese sent him here as part of an espionage mission, but once he got here, he decided to take the opportunity to truly defect. At any rate, we learn a couple of very important things. One, that the US already knew about the intelligence submarine, and two, that they knew where Dr. Zhang was sleeping. Now, they did say that they were going to leave him alone, but that doesn't mean someone couldn't have accessed this terminal or another terminal with this information on it to find out his location so that they could kill him. After all, that is where we find his body. In the next one, interrogation reports. Here we find three reports from Chinese prisoners of war who were interrogated here. The first from John Doe, a submariner. Hunter spent another session in interrogation room B with the surviving crew member from the Chinese spy sub the Navy is attempting recovery on. This guy is demonstrating extraordinary fortitude for a relatively low-ranking grunt. Can't say the Chinese don't make good soldiers out of their boys. I'm sure this one would have gone the same way as his skipper if the cyanide capsule in his molar hadn't been a dud. Hunter requested Method B interrogation clearance, so I'm putting through to Quantico for that in the morning. So the Chinese submariners were to commit suicide if they were captured. They had cyanide capsules embedded in their molars. And we get every impression that the United States 
tortured this poor submariner to get the information they wanted. In the next one, Error, Incomplete Archive, we are simply told to contact a technical officer. But the third one works, and it's an entry on Wang Yang. Yang succumbed under Method D interrogation during the afternoon. Medical examiner called in and verified cause of death as natural for the records. She is filed away in the morgue downstairs for now. Locker TD-0181. We are running out of space down there and may need to do a disposal early this quarter. We saw in the interrogation rooms two methods of torture. The first was electric, strapping up someone to a generator and keeping them alive with stim packs, and the other was some sort of operation. If one of those was method B set up for the submariner, I can only imagine what method D would be. In the next one, Camp Operations Reports. Brenner observed suspicious activity after lights out yesterday. Prisoners apparently snuck into morgue overnight. He had the good sense not to apprehend them before reporting the event. We've known for some time about a septic runoff access point in the basement, which would be a good candidate for the escapees. The runoff flows southwest of the camp about a quarter of a mile or so. We'll keep a low profile about this and post guards in the area. They could make their break any night. Meanwhile, I'll have to find an excuse to send somebody down there and check it out without arousing suspicion. I'd rather catch them in the act. The final note is a dossier on Agent Wang Yang. In it, we find a lot of the same information we've already seen on the Wanted posters. But we find one unique article here about Wang Yang, an intelligence file. Wang Yang, suspected Chinese operative. Previous incarceration, 2062 in Canada, suspected in connection with Niagara sabotage. Yang escaped custody during transport to Albany, New York. Intelligence reports of Chinese activity in Maryland prompted local search efforts, which yielded an anonymous tip leading to Yank's capture and transfer to Turtle Dove Detention Camp. Demonstrates remarkable resistance to interrogation, but yielded classified, connecting the Chinese intelligence community to classified. Admin notice, file altered by intelligence officer, serial number 182129. While unlocking the wall safe behind the portrait, we can contemplate what we just read. So Wang Yang is dead. She died during interrogation, or torture, while the U.S. tried to extract confidential information from her. She was caught because somebody gave an anonymous tip. Could this someone have been Agent Chang, whose corpse we found in his hotel room? That would only make sense if he truly did want to defect, because without her, he couldn't complete his mission. Remember, we came here to find Yang so that we could recover a password stored in her molar. We now know where to look. Her body is stored in the basement. After looting the bathroom, where we found a skeleton with his hand in the toilet, we can head back out the door to Point Lookout. Rounding the corner, we see a basement hatch leading to the underground morgue. As we enter, sure enough, we hear the familiar sound of ghouls. Which brings up an interesting question. Can the process that turns people into ghouls reanimate corpses? I suppose it must be able to do so. After all, glowing ones can resurrect other dead ghouls. Could the ghouls we just killed be the reanimated corpses of some of these tortured Chinese prisoners? In this room, we find a number of chems laid out and the evidence of surgeries and all sorts of unthinkable butchery. Against the western wall, we find a bank of boxes. These must be the drawers within which were kept the corpses. The one on the bottom left belongs to TD-0181, Agent Wang Yang. You found what's left of Agent Yang. Inspecting the remains closely, you discover a false molar tooth. There is a microfilm within that must contain the self-destruct codes for the Chinese submarine. We can leave the tooth alone or remove the self-destruct codes. If we choose to remove them, we complete this portion of the quest. And we can finally have a look at Agent Yang. Sure enough, she no longer looks like her picture. There are a few more drawers here. One belonged to A. Cheng. Inside we find surgical tubing and the other belonged to Mei Shen. And inside we find a plunger. 
I'd hate to think what sort of torture could have been done to this poor woman that involved a plunger. Moving on to the room where we killed the ghouls, we see a stretcher laid out with fission batteries, surgical tubing, and stim packs, and then some sort of grate. Uh, it's a cell door. We can open it. Is this an escape hatch? No, wait, it looks kind of like a chimney. Oh, no. Pushing a button to the left. It's a furnace. They incinerated the remains of the Chinese prisoners they killed under interrogation. Possibly for sanitary reasons, possibly because they just didn't have room to store the bodies, or maybe it was because they wanted to get rid of evidence so that no one would ever know what went on here. On the ground before the furnace is a sewer grate. This must be the tunnel that we read about in the administrator's terminal, the tunnel that the prisoners had hoped to use to escape, but that the guards all knew about. We arrive in a tunnel filled with water, and we see a bit of evidence of some of the prisoners leaving hastily. We find a personal footlocker, locked with an average lock. Inside, we find a full suit of recon armor, a stealth boy, and some chems. Yeah, I can see a prison escapee needing all of that. At the very end of the tunnel, we find a first aid kit, and then a grate that leads to a ladder that brings us topside. We exit out a sewer grate, and nearby, we can loot some supplies that other Chinese escapees must have left for their brethren. We find an easy locked ammunition box and two first aid kits. Nearby, we find two skeletons, each holding a shovel next to one red toolbox. This could mean that the Chinese escapees had masqueraded as sewer workers, only to be killed by the prison guards who knew this manhole was here as they emerged. But we can't spend too much time wondering because we have a submarine to find. The coordinates we found on the microfilm inside Wang Yang's molar leads us to a dock just west of the Point Lookout Lighthouse. At the end of the dock, we find a skeleton with a camera next to an easy locked suitcase. Perhaps these are the remains of another tourist who came here to snap shots of the beautiful lighthouse. Out to sea, we see some sort of wreckage. Is that the submarine? As we get closer, we discover the sub-recovery site, but we realize that what we see here is not the submarine. There's a tiny little dinghy still floating just outside the ship, but there's nothing inside, and aside from a large hook, we don't find anything near it. Beneath it, however, we find a tidy stash, two first aid kits, and an average locked safe with randomized loot inside. But where's the sub? After swimming around this area for a while, I eventually found it. The submarine had foundered in the shallow waters here, driving headfirst into the seafloor. However, it still appears to be mostly intact. We see a hatch on the very top of the submarine, which allows us to enter SSN 371A. We arrive in a small flooded room. We stand waist deep in water. Some sort of emergency signal has been blaring for 200 years, and water pours out of the nearby pipes. There are two ends to this sub, west and east. Heading east first, we see two cots where the Chinese submariners must have slept. There's an average locked personal footlocker beneath them. And inside, we find chems and even a T-45D power armor helmet. There are a few lockers and there's some sort of neon green spill on the ground here. Perhaps this is some of the nuclear fuel that has spilled out, hence the radiation we find in this room. Turning back around, we can head to the end of this tube to find a terminal. Covert Submarine SSN 371A. And you will excuse my pronunciation of this. Shi Sheng Wu Nan Shi Zi Pao Yo U Xin Ren, which loosely translates to You must persevere to accomplish seemingly impossible tasks. Or Where there's a will, there's a way. We find two notes. The first one, Mission Parameters. Classified Directives, Chinese Naval Command, Mission Parameters, Routine Patrol slash Observation. This vessel is ordered to patrol hostile waters between, and they give the longitude and latitude coordinates. Variations from patrol are tolerated as required by evasive circumstances. Crew is under strict instruction not to engage enemy if detected. Self-destruct protocol must be initiated in event of imminent capture. Status updates are required at six-hour intervals by one-way burst calm on orbital frequency number K17.18.V121. We find an option to initiate the self-destruct sequence. Self-destruct protocol initiated. Engineer must activate fail-safe switch in aft engine to confirm sequence. Personnel will have less than one minute to evacuate. 
Heading out and turning around, we see a big switch by that leaking green stuff. Well, we've already selected the authorization, so we can now confirm the self-destruct protocol. Our quest log updates. Get clear of the submarine before it self-destructs. Raising to the ladder, we can swim as far out to sea as possible until... This explosion can kill us if we don't swim fast enough or if we stay inside. But if we successfully swim away fast enough, the next time we return, we see absolutely no trace of the submarine. It's completely gone. After destroying the sub, we must now return to the motel to receive further instruction. We do find one new entry, extraction details. Agent Chang receive automated correspondence of Chinese intelligence ministry. Remote positive of mission parameter satisfactory. Orbital intelligence verifies SSN-371A termination. Please note following from intelligence officer agent ID unavailable. Agent, if you're receiving this message, then our satellites have registered the destruction of your objective. Well done. Please report to my personal bunker, hidden among the grounds of Calvert Mansion. Coordinates have been provided with this transmission. The bunker entrance is hidden, of course. Your pair of cryptochromatic spectacles have been hidden in the water tank of the toilet in your safe house. Retrieve them if you haven't already. Here is the sequence code to unlock the bunker. 132-3442. Once inside, the passphrase is Seraphim Descending. I look forward to congratulating you personally, Agent. Cryptochromatic glasses? Sure enough. In the water tank of the toilet, we find the cryptochromatic spectacles. These glasses have a DR of 1 and no stats, but they look pretty nice and will make a welcome addition to my collection. And I learned something about Calvert Mansion. Remember that greenhouse we saw at Calvert Mansion? Well, apparently it wasn't a greenhouse, but an aviary, a place for keeping birds. Heading on over, we see that after the destruction of Calvert Mansion, smugglers have moved into the aviary. Once dead, we can loot the new supplies they have laid out. We see two first aid kits and a selection of ammo boxes and a footlocker to the south, as well as some makeshift bedding if we need to rest up. But we don't see a hatch, or a door, or a staircase, or anything that might give us a hint as to where we're supposed to go. We were given a code, but where do we input the code? It's then that I noticed these pillars with these beautiful teal vases. There are exactly four of them, and the code we have only spans numbers one, two, three, and four. Each vase is painted a nice solid teal color, but after we put on our cryptochromatic spectacles, yellow lines appear on the vases. This vase has two lines. This one has one. This one has three. This one, four. Taking a look at the note in our log, we see that the cryptochromatic sequence is 1323442. Well, one, three, two, three, four, four, two. A tile on the ground slides away, revealing a hatch to the secret Chinese intelligence bunker. We arrive at the top of a stairway leading down into a brick building. In this room, we see a Protectron walking around. As soon as he sees us, he walks straight to us. This is a hazardous area. For your own safety, please vacate the premises. Step aside, Tin Man. Please exit the hazardous area. The passphrase is Seraphim Descending. Clearance acknowledged. Follow me for your extraction. Debriefing, comrade. With that, the Protectron walks through a brick door. 
He leads us down a staircase and stops right before a security door. Please step inside, agent. Extraction details can be found on the terminal inside. Am I about to be extracted to China? Well, before we begin our journey to China, let's head back upstairs and loot this room. After all, this may be our last opportunity to do so. We find a Chinese officer's sword great for repairing our Jingwei sword, and lots of loot on the shelves. Stealth boys, Chinese pistols, Chinese assault rifles, shotgun shells, frag mines, 10mm ammunition, mini nukes, and chems. There's ammunition and weapons in a nearby cabinet, a nearby workbench, and a whopping 16 ammunition canisters right next to the stairs. After looting each and every one of them, we see more Chinese weapons in some cold food storage cases. And when we're ready, we can head back down the stairs to open the security door like the Protectron requested. To do so, we flip an electrical switch against the northern wall. The door slides open and we can step in. We find ourselves in uh, some sort of tiny room. Okay. Maybe we'll be launched from this room to China? How exactly are we going to get extracted? To the southwest, we see a footlocker upon which are stored some mentats, a Chinese pistol, and some ammunition. Oh, and have I mentioned the blood? Yeah, that's right. This room is covered in blood. Uh, why is this room covered in blood? To the northeast, we find some 10 millimeter ammunition and the unique weapon, the backwater rifle. The Backwater Rifle is a unique lever-action rifle with this DLC that has more damage per shot of any other 10mm weapon in Fallout 3. It also has the second highest damage per shot of all other rifles, only being beaten by Lincoln's Repeater. Even though its damage is 5 lower than Lincoln's Repeater, the Backwater Rifle has a 5 times crit chance multiplier, which gives characters with 10 luck and the finesse perk a 90% chance to critical with each shot. This is an excellent weapon for high luck small guns characters. We can loot a nearby locker and another Chinese officer sword, and all that's left is to access a terminal in this room. Sure, we may be confused now, but perhaps the answers we're looking for are on this terminal. Activating the extraction terminal, we learn that the terminal has no operating system, for some reason, and we find one option, an extraction briefing. You have done well to get this far, Asian Chang. Your payment has been transacted to your next of kin under the pretext of a ration lottery. With deepest respect, however, your life must now be terminated for the good of the People's Republic. Go with dignity, honorable soldier. Oh no, we've been double-crossed. The security door slams shut and radioactive gas begins to fill the chamber. With all of this blood, exactly how many Chinese secret agents have been executed in this room? There are a few ways to escape with our lives, but we need to think quickly. First, we've got to stop this radiation from pouring into the room. To do so, we can activate the ventilator duct on the ground, and if we have a repair of 30 or greater, we can disable the vent. With the radiation turned off, we now have a little more time to think while escaping. When we test the door, no, nothing happens. It's locked. It's then we notice to the right, uh, two boards leaning against something on the wall. We can push them aside. What is this? This circuitry is wired directly to the door. While quite complicated, a skilled technician could override the door's controls from here. We can leave the circuitry alone, or we can pass a 71 science check to override the door controls. If we have enough science, we can choose this option. And we escape with our lives. But what about for characters who don't have 71 in science? That is, after all, quite a lot of science to have. How do we get out? Well, there is one final escape route. After deactivating the radiation vent, we can climb the tipped-over locker to the north. This allows us to jump on top of a shipping container, which then allows us to jump on top of a cement platform which leads to one of the radiation ventilation pipes. This pipe forms a ramp which we can climb to cross a pipe to reach a big iron girder. We can then follow this girder to the very end where we find a hatch to a runoff pipe. On the other side, we see the remains of a Chinese special agent who 
almost made it. Perhaps he got doused with just too much radiation before he succumbed to his injuries. We can loot the stim packs and the rat away that this guy left behind, and it's then we learn that we have completed the quest, The Velvet Curtain. The pipe then leads us east and down until we meet the water. Heading underwater, we can open a hatch to Point Lookout where we arrive on the seafloor. Before we run out of breath, we can swim to the surface to emerge just north of where the espionage submarine once rested. It's then that we get attacked by Mirelurks. And that is the full story of the Velvet Curtain and the fate of Chinese Special Agent Yang Wang. I had so much fun with this quest. This has got to be one of the most entertaining quests I've done in any of the Fallout games. I love everything about it. The pre-war lore, the espionage, the intrigue, the double cross, the weapons, all of it. What are your thoughts on the Velvet Curtain? How quickly did you piece together all of the clues? And what did you think about that cryptochromatic puzzle in the aviary? Which I think was a national treasure reference. Let me know your thoughts in the comments section below. We've tackled most of the major quests of this DLC so far, but we've still got quite a bit to do. In our upcoming episodes, we will uncover the horrible deeds of a corrupt mine owner, and we will stumble upon an elderly man sitting alone in a manner obsessed with the occult. I publish a new Fallout video six days a week on a wide range of topics spanning all of the games, but I'm dedicating this week to the Point Lookout DLC for Fallout 3. If you want to make sure that you don't miss an episode, be sure to subscribe and to click that bell notification button. You can follow me on Twitter and Facebook to keep up to date with all Oxhorn news. And if you like what I do and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming one of my patrons on Patreon. But more than anything, I'm just so glad you're here watching this video with me today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you tomorrow morning, bright and early, with a brand new video.